Well, hello there, and you join us here today to talk about a watch. A watch by Audemars Piguet. A watch by Audemars Piguet that costs $1.7 million. Tom, what would you do with $1.7 million? Well, yeah, I've been I've been having those sorts of thoughts lately. I've got three numbers on the lottery, so pretty flush. <laughs> Extra 30 quid. So yeah, I've been shopping around. And this AP has caught my eye. I think I need to know a little bit more about it, though, before I pull the trigger. <laughs> well, it's just as well, because we're exactly here to do that. This is the Audemars Piguet Code 1159 Universelle. Um, this is really Audemars Piguet putting their money where their mouth is. It's really backing the Code 1159, which hasn't had the smoothest of... Uh, starts as a new piece in the Audemars Piguet collection. So they've gone all out, Tom. They've created a watch in the Code 1159 series and they have put literally everything in it. You know, like the universe has everything in it, so does this. Yeah. They probably call it a technical showcase. And in, in fact, this is number four of the brand's research and development timepieces. Code mm. RD number four for this Code 1159, to confuse you further. Yeah. Um, a bit like, you know, how Patek Philippe has the advanced research division where they create wild and wonderful and wacky new technological developments that they may or may not integrate into their wider collection. Sure. Um, it's also actually a tribute to a watch from 1899, which AP made for German Watchmaker Union, also called Le Universel. A similar type of thing where they took all of the complications and crammed them into one watch. Right. Do you want to find out a little bit more about this little beastie? Yeah, tell me more. What have they crammed into this thing? Well, it's $1.7 million if you buy the skeletonized version, but there's also a non-skeletonized version if you want to save a bit of cash and only spend around $1.5 million. So, you know, leave a little bit to the side for, you know, odd bits. A new strap, maybe? Yeah, it's nice to give people the options, isn't it? It's not a limited edition. Ooh. Although I can't imagine that they're going to be churning these things out because at 1,155 parts it probably takes a while to make. Packed within the Calibre 1000, you also get a 64-hour power reserve from dual barrels and a, a more traditional 21,600 VPH beat. But really what we're here to discover is the complications, and there are a few of them, no less than 23. That's a lot. That's more complications than I know. <laughs> it's one more than 22. Does the, is the time a complication? Does that count? That's the main one. Yeah, that's that's the one we all know and love, isn't it? That's the bread and batter right there. What's the time? I, you're chiming at me, but what's the time? <laughs> uh, they spread that out a bit because, you know, they want to be a little bit loosey-goosey with the numbers. They say there are 40 functions, but I, I think that just means the chronograph has got like start, stop and go back again, all those kinds of things. That sounds like a lot. I'd like to know what they all are in an itemised list. I yeah. don't know if that's available anywhere. But I imagine the time is, that's three, isn't it? Hours, minutes, seconds. Yeah. So that's three. There's 37 more. Yeah. Crown goes in, <laughs> crown goes out, all that kind of stuff. You can take the strap off and use the lugs to open paint cans. <laughs> That's one. Well, I can give you some of the official complications that they have listed. Go on. It has a flying tourbillon. Whew, that's a big one. It is, yeah. And if you look on Audemars Piguet's website... Actually, no, people don't count that as a complication, do they? So I'm not counting that. <laughs> well, I suppose neither do Audemars Piguet, because if you look at their website, their animation is actually wrong. It should be pivoting around the palette fork jewel. Oh, yeah. But it's not. It's going all kinds of crazy. Um, there is a big date. There is a moon phase, which we'll talk about in a bit. Perpetual calendar, again, we'll talk about that more in a bit. Split seconds and flyback chronograph. Ooh. Minute repeater and a grand sonnery. The grand sonnery is such a scarce complication that I had actually forgotten what it even did. Do you care to hazard a guess as to what it might do? Well, so grand sonnery, I thought that was, isn't that just a fancy name for minute repeater? What, what's the difference? What, are they two separate things? I thought the grand sonnery was the, the chiming. Isn't that what Grand Sonnery is? That's French for like big, big ringer or something like that. <laughs> big sound from the underground. Exactly, yeah. Um, so a minute repeater is an on-demand complication. Tell me the time in hours, quarters and minutes through chime when I press this button. Whereas the Grand Sonnery is more like a passive complication. If you've turned it on, on the hour it will chime, a bit like the Christopher Ward bel canto, oh. but it will also, on the quarter, will chime the hours and quarters as well. 
So it's just every now and then it's going, uh, the time is quarter past one. Everything's fine. Cool. Well, in the same way that my Casio beeps on the hour. Yeah. So there's a, a few very traditional complications in there, but Audemars Piguet has gone to great lengths to try and do them the AP way. We'll start with the perpetual calendar. Most perpetual calendars run out of puff by the year 2100, because in the year 2100, we skip a leap year. It happens every 400 years, I think. Okay. And so a perpetual calendar is like, oh, every four years there's a leap year. And then it gets to the year 2100. And it's like, oh, there's a leap year. And the calendar's like, no, there isn't. And that has to be reset. This one incorporates that skipped leap year in the year 2100. And so it's good to go until the year 2400, Tom. So you won't have to set it until then. Oh, well, that's great. They're really thinking about the problems of the common man there, aren't they? Yeah. I mean, they could just say that, couldn't they? I mean, who's going to know? <laughs> Presumably, you have to take it in for a service before then, so they'll probably just reset it then anyway. Yeah. Um, and not only that, but they've also incorporated some of the knowledge they gleaned from RD number two, one of their research and development pieces, the Royal Oak Perpetual Ultra Thin Prototype, which took the perpetual calendar and merged it from two layers into one. And they've done this by uh, making the program wheel a single layer, by also incorporating the end of month cam into the date wheel and the month cam into the month wheel. I don't know what that means, but it sounds cool. And if you can't incorporate your month cam into the cam wheel, stuck a lab the cam wheel into the month wheel. Next, cam the wheel. And this, amongst uh, a few other things we'll talk about, means that it's only 42 millimeters wide and 15.5 millimeters thick. Now that's pretty beasty, you might say. Yeah, it looks like a chunker. But if you take the IWC Portuguese Grand Complications, that's 45 millimeters wide and 16.5 millimeters thick. So slightly bigger. Okay. How many complications has that one got? Oh, so, huh? Okay, comparable. So um, it also has a very interesting moon phase complication, Tom, which uses two discs, one layered on top of the other, a bit like uh, Langer's Big Date. Uh-huh, yeah. Each one has five different moon illustrations printed on it. Yeah. And together they will create ten different images for the moon phase in the little window. Oh, that's cool. Yeah. Also, Tom, the gong for the minute repeater and sonnery is attached directly to the sapphire crystal in the back. You might remember we have mentioned this before with um, Patek Philippe, right? Yeah, so they used like an ultra thin piece of sapphire, sort of like a sort of drum skin soundboard thing for, to increase the reverberation of the gongs. Yeah, the Advanced Research 5750 Minute Repeater, which you described as looking like a what? It looks like a hubcap. Hmm. Um, that also had this... Oh, it looks like racing hubcaps. Right. So that's, that's... <laughs> I'm going to get some racing hubcaps for my car. If I'm going to be charitable about it. Uh, but that also incorporated a similar sort of sapphire speaker system. Yeah. This time, though, you'll notice that the case back has a case back. A little, a little lid, like a jam jar. Flips open. Yeah, it's a secret pop-up back hatch action, which... That's brilliant. That pays for itself, doesn't it? That's hours of fun. <laughs> and you'll see there that it's got holes to let the sound out when it's shut. So I'm not quite sure why they have it, because they've had to put holes in it to let the sound out. And also they've gone to great pains to make this watch thinner and then added like another flap on the back. Hmm. Interesting. Is it to sort of separate it from the wrist so the sound's not like muffled against the wrist? Oh, that's a good idea, actually. Yeah, that's that's probably a very good reason why they've done that. Plus, also, pop-up back hatch, which is fun. Yeah. Twofer. But it gets even better, Tom. How can it possibly? Well, you know how, when you have a split-second chronograph, you've got the base movement, you've got the chronograph, and then you've got the split-second module on top of that, and you get quite a stack. Yeah. And you know how that all looks like, this really kind of intricate city of parts, really mesmerising and, and fascinating, and that's where you feel like you've spent your money. Yeah. Well, Audemars Piguet wanted to cover all that up with a rotor weight, so you couldn't see it so well. But the problem with that is it added another layer and even more thickness, so what they've done is they put a big old hole in the middle of the rotor weight, and it straddles that third layer of the split-second mechanism, which is like the crabby-like pincers that sit around that wheel. What do you think of that? So the rotor weight covers up the the beautiful mass of complications there. Yes. But saves on winding. 
Yeah. So that's good. Also, it's got a cool waveform visualization engraved on the rotorweight as well. So that's two against one. Yeah, but they've recognised that most of the good stuff is being covered, so they put a little window in it, a bit like what the butler saw, so you can see the split-second mechanism, save a bit of height. Okay. Saves 1.1 millimetres, Tom, which has all been added back with our flappy case back there. Cool. Yeah, I mean, even with the integration and condensing things into single layers, you see that exploded view there. It's still really big, isn't it? There's so much going on there that they've squished inside. It's very impressive. Yeah, 1155 parts. But they innovate even further, Tom. Not content with reimagining the inside of a grand complication, they've also reimagined the outside. So you know how all of those different features, they need controls. Some of them you'll use very infrequently, like setting the calendar. You can set that once and never set it again until the year 2400. Those kinds of functions don't need adjusting very often. And so they created the hidden pusher, a little dimple in the side of the case that you use a tool or a paperclip or a biro or whatever to, to change that whenever you need to, which isn't very often. And that makes the case look sleeker, more elegant, doesn't have all of these buttons and things sprouting out of it. Audemars PK thought, no, we want people to be able to easily adjust the functions on their watch without having to go and find said biro. Yeah. And so now you've got all of that functionality on the case uh, available and easy to use with your fingers. I'll go through them for you now. You've got the crown where it normally is, and then you've got a pusher up at two o'clock and a pusher at four o'clock. Okay, standard chronograph stuff. Yeah, standard chronograph. You've also got a pusher mounted in the crown for the split seconds. Oh. And then around the pushers in the chronograph at two o'clock, you have the sonary switch, so you can turn it on or off. Right, yep. And then around the pusher at four o'clock, you've got a quick set perpetual calendar function. And the great thing about that is you can go forwards and backwards with it, so you don't do that thing that you can do with other crown set perpetual calendars and go forwards and find you can't go backwards and then you have to send it back to the shop. You also get shock resistance and 20 meters of water resistance, if you fancy using that. 20 meters. Yeah, you take that for a splash. Yes, I am the kind of guy that would spend $1.3 million on a watch and take it in the bath. So that's <laughs> good to know. Um, and then on the left-hand side of the case, you've got buttons for the day quick set, minute repeater, and the moon phase. So lots of little tweaky, fun things to press and poke around. Nice, cool, yeah. I mean, again, it's convenience, isn't it? The amount of people I speak to every day who are just like, I'm so sick of having to unfurl a paperclip every time I want to change the moon phase on my Grand Complication <laughs> watch. And so I'm just like, well, now I can say, well, AP's got you covered yep. with the code 1159 Universal. This is, with its easy functionality, ultra thinness, shock resistance and water resistance to 20 meters. This is the watch for the common man. And I salute them for it. Yeah, I mean, I wouldn't say ultra thinness, but um, <laughs> it's a very impressive spec sheet there, isn't it? And and it also does that thing that I like with Grand Complications where it looks pretty straightforward on the front. It's very legible. You can see everything that's going on. It looks quite quite simplistic. I think this is a really cool watch. Funnily enough, Audemars Piguet's whole uh, approach to this is to make a grand complication watch that you can use and enjoy without having all of the fears of it being fragile or difficult to set or easy to break. Um, it's a highly, highly complicated watch that is designed to endure the rigours of reasonable daily use, which, let's face it, is going to the office and back for most people. <laughs> and doing all of that supposedly took seven years to achieve. So they've kept themselves busy with it, at least. Yeah. Didn't you say they couldn't have built it within the last five years? I didn't say that. They said that. Oh. So what were they doing for the first two years? Dreaming. Dreaming. Dreaming big, Tom. Yeah, that's what you got to do, isn't it? To come up with something like this. And I do like that. I People complain that Audemars Piguet is a one-watch brand. Yeah. And this regardless of whether people like the aesthetics or not, demonstrates that it is a watchmaker of high complication of, I hesitate to use the word because it gets overused in the Swiss watch industry, innovation. They're trying different things. They're approaching stuff in slightly different ways just to showcase what's possible. And ultimately, that's what we want to see at the, the bleeding edge of mechanical watchmaking. So, well done, AP. 
yes very very impressive dear viewer and listener what do you think of this watch and what it stands for when it comes to ap's heritage in making complicated watches are you glad to see its existence or are you nonplussed let us know in the comments below thank you so much for watching and listening please do like and subscribe as well and we'll see you next time goodbye bye bye